Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katherine James. I'm head of digital and public engagement at the Richard Diebenkorn Foundation. And I'm here today at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, Los Angeles, out in their wonderful outdoor sculpture garden on the first day of summer with their chief curator, Emily Talbot. <laughs> Emily, thank you so much for having us. It's such a pleasure to have you all in the garden today. Wonderful, so uh, as we wait for a few people to join the room, I'm just gonna continue introducing myself a few times just so that we all know where we're at. Um, again, my name is Katherine James. I'm head of digital and public engagement at the Richard Diebenkorn Foundation. And I'm here today at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, California, uh, out in their beautiful sculpture garden on the first day of summer. And I'm here with the chief curator, Emily Talbot. Um, who's sitting beside me. Hello, Emily. Hi, thanks so much for joining us. Do not be surprised if we're pummeled with flowers throughout the recording. Exactly. Um, we're here today on two special occasions. One is for Emily's show, Alternate Realities, which is a group show tracking four groundbreaking artists who worked in the 1950s and 60s in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area, including Richard Diebenkorn. We're also here, of course, to celebrate hashtag Diebenkorn 100, which is the artist centennial, a year long celebration, coast to coast of the artist's work up in museum institutions across the country. All right, okay, I'm getting the signal that it's okay to get going. We've got enough people in the room. So good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. I'm Catherine James, head of digital and public engagement at the Richard Diebenkorn Foundation. And I'm here today at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, Los Angeles out in their beautiful sculpture garden on the first day of summer. And I'm here with Emily Talbot, who is their chief curator. Emily, thank you so much for hosting us. It's a pleasure to have you all. Wonderful. So Emily is in charge of the display and of the permanent collection at the Norton Simon Museum. She joined the museum's curatorial department as a specialist in 19th and 20th century European art. And she has lectured widely and published on 19th century realism, 20th century printmaking and the history of collecting. And again, if you just are joining us, we are here on occasion of her show, Alternate Realities, which tracks four groundbreaking artists, Richard Diebenkorn, John Altoon, Frank Lobdell, and Emerson Wolfer, who worked in the 1950s and 60s in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. And of course, we're also here to celebrate hashtag Diebenkorn 100, which is the artist centennial celebration it's a year-long celebration, coast to coast, with museums installing work from the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, to the Norton Simon here in Pasadena, California. And again, we're doing events like this one live to celebrate the centennial. So we encourage you to join in and participate by using the hashtag Diebenkorn100 of sightings of his works either at the Norton Simon here or anywhere else in the country. And it's a particularly special treat for me to be here because I'm the voice of the foundation's channel. So it's a rare opportunity to be on the other side <laughs> of the camera and a special treat to be with Emily today. Aww. So Emily, thank you. Thank you so much. So I also think we should talk a little bit about this historic place that we're sitting in, which um, for the artist, uh, it was an important point in 1960 because the museum hosted his first mid-career retrospective. And it was the first time that he had a retrospective in his career in 1960, and it was curated by Thomas Levitt. So Emily, I was hoping we could chat a little bit about the museum's role in contextualizing his work at this point in his career. Yeah, absolutely. Well, exactly as Catherine says, I think this exhibition was a really pivotal moment for Diebenkorn. It's his first mid-career retrospective, and it featured 10 years of the artist's work from 1950 to 1960. So this is the moment, as you all know, where he's making this shift from abstraction to figuration. And I think for the artist, it was much more typical to separate these two moments in his career, and this exhibition was a chance to bring them together and for people to see these works hanging side by side and in dialogue with each other as the artist intended. 
The exhibition was organized by Thomas Levitt, who was then the director of the former Pasadena Art Museum, our predecessor institution, and it was held at their institution on Los Robles in downtown Pasadena. So not the exact spot where, where we're sitting now, but uh, the former Pasadena Art Museum is the predecessor of the Norton Simon Museum, and so we're really thrilled to be the guardians of that legacy now. The exhibition had 66 works in it, of which 35 were lent by Diebenkorn. And as I was going through the exhibition archive, it was really fun to read this correspondence between Levitt and Diebenkorn and to get a sense of how closely the artist was involved in organizing the exhibition. He was so enthusiastic about it that he initially said, OK, I've narrowed my list down to 50 works <laughs> that you can include in the show. And Levitt was like, I'm sorry, we only have this amount of space, so we can only include 35 because they'd gotten such good responses from private collectors and other institutions that wanted to lend to the exhibition. Um, it was very well received and Diebenkorn was really thrilled by it. It's actually very touching to read the correspondence between he and Levitt in the fall of 1960 after the exhibition closed because Diebenkorn talks about never having had the chance to see this much of his work installed quite densely so that the works are just side by side and to really cut across the different modes in which he was working. Yeah, and I, in anticipation of this conversation, I was lo also looking back at some of the critical reviews that came out, and it was really widely reviewed at the time. Mm -hmm. The Los Angeles Times wrote about it, Arts Magazine wrote about it, mm -hmm. and specifically the Arts Magazine asserted that, quote, the earlier abstracts are quite successful in their own terms, but in the figurative paintings, one welcomes Diebenkorn's daring blend of compositional freedom and structural integration of weighted form and open space, of sensuous resonance and ideal repose. So I thought that was a really nice, as you were saying, the first time to really see some of his abstractions mm -hmm. alongside the newer figurative work. Yeah, and I can imagine that it was really thrilling for the artist to see how closely people were engaging with the work when they're writing things like that. Um, one of the really lovely endpoints to the exhibition was that Diebenkorn invited Levitt to select a work from his studio that would be donated in his honor to the Pasadena Art Museum, and we still have that painting in our collection. Wonderful. So let's also talk also about um, Berkeley number 24, which was in that big show, and also as part of the museum's collection. And looking at the whole collection from by art by Diebenkorn, uh, the dates range from 1948 to 1960s mm -hmm. and span across his mediums. Do you want to just chat a little bit about their holdings? Yeah, absolutely. So we have three beautiful paintings in the collection of the Norton Simon Museum by Diebenkorn. Untitled number 22 from 1948, so this is the earliest work that you're mentioning now. Um, this one was given by Josephine and Paul Cantor, who were the artist's first representatives uh, in 19 the 1960 mid-career retrospective was lent then by Robert Rowan, who is a collector, important collector of Diebenkorn's work in 1967, and Bottles from 1960, which is the lovely figurative work that Diebenkorn gave himself in thanks for the 1960 exhibition. We also have a beautiful sketchbook of Diebenkorn's work from around 1950, we think, either shortly before or after he moves to Albuquerque. The sketchbook is unbound. Uh, it, it was in a spiral bound notebook, so you still have those wonderful little perforated edges along the margins. But it's a workbook that he clearly was turning all around. He's painting on the front and back, and we've installed it. Some of them are framed on the wall in a kind of whimsical way, but we've also included four works that are seen vertically so that you can see both sides, you can move around them, and really get a sense of how energetically he was applying um, paint and gouache and watercolor to these sheets. Wonderful. Well, speaking about the show, um, there's four artists in it. Alternate Realities uh, includes Richard Diebenkorn, John L. Toon, Emerson Wolfer, and Frank Lobdell, and it's drawn entirely from the museum's collection of post-war American art. And I'm hoping that we can just chat a little bit about, as you say in your exhibition text, um, quote, exploring the expressive potential of figurative forms. Mm -hmm. Let's chat a little bit about the theme of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this exhibition really celebrates the rich holdings of the former Pasadena Art Museum's collection of post-war American art. And the exhibition is one that's particularly special to me because it deals with a subject that I've been interested in in 19th century French art as much as 20th century American art, which is how artists are negotiating relationships between abstraction and figuration in various ways. The 1950s and 60s 
in the United States is a moment where abstract expressionism is the dominant stylistic mode. And each of the artists represented in this exhibition are you know, working within the legacy of that mode and are really interested in it, um, integrating it into their work in various ways, but they're not excising figuration or representation entirely. Each of them is creating an interesting and quite personal dialogue between these two modes. So John Altoon, for example, was a trained illustrator and he had this incredible facility with draftsmanship and with line. And so we have some works in the collection that have um, these really interesting organic forms that he's drawn very, very delicately, sometimes outlined with airbrush and other um, forms of kind of commercial art practice that he integrated into his work. Um, these forms are somewhat familiar, but they don't fully cohere as coherent narratives, so um, the work just invites you to look closely and to think more about what you're seeing. Um, in comparison to someone like Emerson Wolfer, who's also based in LA as Altoon was, Wolfer was a self-described abstract surrealist, and he was really interested in working spontaneously, intuitively, either with paint, which was uh, initially his dominant mode, but also with torn paper. He starts out using torn paper as a way of sort of planning his compositions, making changes and corrections, but then he becomes so interested in collage and in the kind of spontaneity that tearing of paper encouraged mm -hmm. that that becomes a working process for him too. So there's a, there's a variety of ways in which these artists are engaging with those issues. Wonderful. Okay, that sounds quite interesting and the reason why you all have to come to the museum to visit and <laughs> see the do. show. Mm -hmm. But I also want to chat a little bit about Diebenkorn's placement mm -hmm. in the exhibition who himself uh, turned to figuration in 1955, um, but many recognizable forms started to show up in the abstractions the years prior. So mm -hmm. we can chat a little bit about that and yeah. his transition. Absolutely. Well, Diebenkorn I think is the poster child for the topic of this exhibition because his work is so well known for having this, these distinct periods of abstraction and figuration. But I think what the Norton Simon collection really shows us is that there's an interesting blurring between these two modes and that one naturally leads into the other and you can in a way as a viewer sort of tune in and out to the ways in which figuration or abstraction might be playing a role in each work in the exhibition. Yeah, and speaking of that, I enjoyed your um, text on the painting Bottles, which is by the artist a figurative painting from 1960 and you specifically wrote about how it quote reveals Diebenkorn extending color and graphic principles into representational space and loosely rendered planes of blue turquoise and lavender I'm hoping we can chat a little bit about the formal devices that were used in that work specifically around structure mm -hmm. and expressive brushwork and how it really is an example that Diebenkorn was employing at the time, but that also cut across his periods throughout his career. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've hit on one of my favorite works um, in the collection by Diebenkorn. It's just such a beautiful painting, and I really encourage you all to come see it in the flesh because there's nothing quite like experiencing a Diebenkorn in person. Um, Bottles, you know, has this lovely backstory in terms of uh, Levitt selecting it as the work to mark this special moment between he and Diebenkorn at the time of their 1960 retrospective, and it depicts this very intimate scene from the artist's studio. A few bottles and other objects laid out on a sort of tipped up table surface. Front and center is this beautiful glass carafe, so you can see him really using white paints and colors to sort of evoke this transparency. And then just behind it is an opaque ink jar, and sort of alongside the carafe there is a line of what may be cigarettes, maybe paintbrushes. Um, feel free to jump in the chat and let us know what you think it might be. Um, painted on canvas with such a buttery stroke, you can really see Diebenkorn just delving into the, the materials of oil paint itself and kind of really enjoying the moment of creating this work. So initially, you know, you, you engage with this, I think, in terms of recognizing the forms that are represented, but you look longer, you look at it in the context of other works in the Simons collection, and you can see him working so much in dialogue with the Berkeley period, for example. So if we bring Berkeley 24 into the conversation, what's been so interesting to me is to see how the forms of the table and this very gestural brushwork that Diebenkorn uses in bottles are absolutely the same techniques that he's using for a painting like Berkeley 24. And you get in Berkeley 24 a kind of fabulous inverse of the bottles composition in terms of the tripartite compositional structure that we see so often in Diebenkorn's work of this period. And then that interesting relationship between slightly tighter, more geometric forms, and then this like vigorous brushwork where he's just clearly loving the process of painting. 
Yes, and it still is quite loose when he goes back to bottles. Mm. For me, I really see uh, such like slabs of bubblegum ice cream. The color is so vivid mm. and that white gray circles and curves and that recessed impression of the water mic watermark ring in the upper mm. corner. Um, it's kind of like a Venn diagram of commonalities a little bit. Absolutely. Um, and that ring, especially like the way that it seems like Demon Corn's just stepped away, you know, like he's just left this ring. There's such a presence. It's such a presence of process. Uh, everything's moving. Mm. Um, it also brings to mind uh, the time period, which uh, is in 1960 and a few years prior in 1957 um, was the first time in the Bay Area where the group of painters that were working figuratively were presented in an exhibition at the Oakland Museum for the first time as a group. And so this was a big moment in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was curated by Paul Mills and at the time Diebenkorn was quoted, um, it's become a very famous quote that I think you also have included in your text, uh, where Diebenkorn said, reality has to be digested, it has to be transmuted by paint, it has to be given a twist of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I love that element of how he's bringing that into the figuration. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that could be the quote that kind of defines the exhibition because it's so much about the ways that figurative artists are not just transcribing what they see, but of course, perceiving, interpreting, and then, you know, translating that to paint, to a whole nother material in which they're evoking the presence of these objects that inspired them. Exactly. Okay, let's chat a little bit about um, some of the artist's commitment to drawing. Mm -hmm. Stephen Korn had a huge commitment to drawing throughout his career, and specifically he had a close friendship with Frank Lobdell also, and they both shared this love and commitment to drawing throughout their careers. Mm -hmm. Um, in the 1960s, Stephen Korn and Lobdell were both working at the California School of Fine Arts in San Francisco, and um, they really at the time, as you assert in your text, uh, quote, honed their treatment of light and shade through a weekly practice of sketching the nude. So I'm hoping we can chat a little bit about that and mm -hmm. also your assertion that Lobdell was really engaging with drawing um, that he thought was different from works of art in their mm -hmm. own right and more something else and how that might be a little bit different from how Diebenkorn was working um, and his engagement with the activity of drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the exhibition has one gallery in which Frank Lobdell and Richard Diebenkorn are seen in the same space and in dialogue with each other, which just kind of nicely replicates the experience that they had in life in terms of sharing this weekly practice of sketching the nude. The figurative drawing practice really begins with David Park, who initiated it with Stephen Korn and Elmer Bischoff earlier in the 1950s. And then as David Park's health declines, they invite Frank Lobdell to join them in 1959. And then Lobdell and Stephen Korn and Bischoff continue with this weekly process of sketching the nude until 1966 when Stephen Korn leaves for LA and Lobdell moves to Stanford. So it's clearly uh, a practice that everyone felt really committed to and that they felt informed their work in different ways. What's interesting, though, I think, is to look at how that plays out in Lobdell's work versus Stephen Korn's, because Lobdell is really very well known as an abstract painter. I think there is something vaguely bimorphic in the forms that he produces in his paintings and prints, but nothing overtly recognizable, nothing that's completely familiar um, to human eyes. But the ways in which he's engaging with the human form, his interest in light and shade, and even to some degree, the materials that he's working with, because Lobdell introduces this type of paper to their drawing practice that um, was coated uh, in some way. And so when you moistened that, it produced this kind of gouache-like effect. So they're actually not just drawing with pencil and ink, but also, you know, inviting a kind of painting into that process. Um, I've installed the Lobdell drawings adjacent to his prints so that you can just get a sense of how a figurative drawing practice might actually undergird work in abstraction because of that sensitivity to form. With Diebenkorn, it's obviously a little bit different because he does move into more recognizably figurative forms you know, in relationship to this drawing practice, they're happening simultaneously. But I don't think we see any of the figurative drawings as preparatory to the paintings. It's about immersing yourself in the act of creation. And to that end, you know, I don't think they saw these drawings as works of art in the same way that they saw their paintings and published prints as works of art. They wanted to sort of relax into the process of drawing, to have that freedom to say, the product doesn't matter, it's about learning and growing as an artist as I'm making them. 
Yeah, there was such a wonderful spontaneity and leaning into the intuition of process-based working Mm -hmm. um, that was really fresh at that time. Mm -hmm. It also brings to mind to me that these artists, Lobdell and Diebenkorn, met many years prior when um, Clifford Still, Mark Rothko, David Park, Bischoff, um, Mm -hmm. Ad Reinhardt, Claire Falkenstein, they all were at the California School of Fine Arts right after World War II um, on GI Bill funds, where Mm -hmm. many of them were enrolling in the institution or as art instructors. And at that time, they were really all engaged in this beautiful kind of freewheeling quality, as Bischoff Mm -hmm. remarked about. And it was less about uh, artists and instructor and more about just older and younger artists working in this like beautiful openness Mm -hmm. that I think is a very special time for that creative experimentation around abstract expressionism. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds idyllic. Um, But what's interesting is that these drawings, even though they're private works, you know, they're not necessarily made to be exhibited. The Pasadena Art Museum did organize an exhibition of Diebenkorn and Lobdell's drawings together in 1961. So there's this like wonderful kind of public moment where they're debuted as well. And people were really excited to see them in person because they've really been kept private Mm -hmm. for um, just, it was their private weekly sessions Mm -hmm. that the artists were getting together. Wonderful. Well, I'm hoping we can chat, we can circle back a little bit to uh, the sketchbook uh, that's by Deben Court in the Norton Simon collection. Mm-hmm. You chatted a little bit about um, how you installed it, but maybe we want to chat a little bit more about what are some of the forms and the paper uh, backs and fronts. And yeah, absolutely. Well, it, you know, drawing for Deben Corn, I think, was not done as a preparatory practice, but always about having that freedom to experiment and to try things out. And the sketchbook gives you such a sense of that immediacy and the way that he was, you know, so fascinated and inspired by color relationships. The drawings themselves range from black and white and kind of shades of gray at times to these incredibly vibrant, gorgeous colors, these like hot pinks and oranges, deep turquoises. There's some layering, but it's not quite the same as when a painting kind of holds in those various layers. And you can look at a demon corn painting, especially along the moments where two types of colors meet and see how many layers and how you know many different colors he's including. The watercolor drawings, on the other hand, it's just the surface, you know, he's done one take flipped it over and tried again, experimented with a different kind of color. So um, I feel like when you look at Deben Corn drawings, you kind of get invited into the artist process in a little way. Which is wonderful. I think it's quite interesting, just as you were saying, the difference between paper and painting. So we could also chat a little bit about the 1948 Untitled Number 22 by Deben Corn, which was made during his Sausalito years. Uh, he was still teaching at the California School of Fine Arts. Mm-hmm. but. He lived across the bay in an artist, artist community, which was just north of the bay, the Golden Gate Bridge, not the Bay Bridge. <laughs> um, and he made this wonderful um, painting that's in the collection. Do you want to chat a little bit about the textures and differences of that piece as yeah, well? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like Untitled 22 is the kind of sleeper hit of the Demon Corn collection at the Norton Simon Museum because it's not as well of a known as well known as some of the other works that we have by Diebenkorn in the collection, but it's a really lovely work, one that's definitely worth seeing in person. It's constructed with these sort of broad color fields of a kind of like mustardy yellow and a sort of hunter green, but then interrupted each time with these unbelievably striking stripes of red and kind of deep orange pigment, lots of impasto, and so that sort of three-dimensionality to the surface is obviously something that's hard to translate into a digital image, but when you look at the painting, and you're encouraged to with that thickness of surface, at these moments where those color passages meet, you can see layer upon layer upon layer of paint underneath and really get a sense of how thickly Deben Korn was applying paint at this moment in his career. Um, The painting has a really wonderful kind of historical importance in terms of Deben Korn's career because it's the first painting that he exhibits in Los Angeles. Um, So 1948, when this painting is made, um, he's just come off of his first one-man show at the Legion of Honor, Flying High, and he submits this work to the California Centennial Exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum. Out of 1,500 submissions, it's one of 101 works selected to represent you know, art making in California at this moment. And it's the first time that, you know, Diebenkorn is sort of debuted to the Los Angeles public. 
He is seen by curators at MoMA, at what will become the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and also seen by Josephine and Paul Cantor, who are uh, kind of burgeoning art dealers. They own a frame shop at that moment, and they go to Albuquerque the following summer to visit Diebenkorn and Phyllis, and um, purchase Untitled 22 from them at that moment, along with maybe one or two other works for the enormous price of $150 uh, per painting, so he got in early. <laughs> it would be nice if we could still achieve that. <laughs> but it's like such a critical moment for Diebenkorn because, you know, he's becoming a professional working artist, you know, beginning to support his family on the basis of the work that he's making. And the Cantors, you know, take these works back and, you know, you have many letters on your website that really sort of chronicle the enthusiasm and the excitement that both Cantors feel about Diebenkorn's work, how much they're encouraging him to like, produce, 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 send us what you're doing, send us slides so that we can spread the word about the work that you're making. Wonderful. Um, well, I also want to chat a little bit about uh, Diebenkorn's incorporation of landscape into his abstraction. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we can fast forward a few years from the Sausalito time in the 1940s, late 1940s, and then he's in Albuquerque, as you were mentioning, in the early 50s. But then he does come back to the Bay and is painting in Berkeley, and he's making these pretty large abstract expressionist canvases. And we've mentioned them earlier in this discussion, um, but in the can in the Norton Simons collection, Berkeley number 24 is one of those examples. Mm -hmm. Maybe we want to chat about when he was allowing landscape to enter into these abstractions, whether he was struggling with that mm -hmm. or really leaning into that aspect of painting. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like it depends on who you ask in a way, but with Berkeley number 24, you know, this is one of a series of paintings that Diebenkorn made between, you know, 1953 and about 1956 as he's shifting more into figuration. Um, our particular work has a palette that really reminds you of place. It has, um, the upper register is this sort of uh, dark charcoaly black, and then there's a, a register of a sort of moody purpley gray. So these sort of rock-like colors. And then in the lower half of the canvas, you get this very gestural kind of spring-like green that he's applying really vigorously over a kind of sandy taupe. It's a little hard to describe, but all the colors in the work really, to me, evoke outdoor landscape-like space. So I think it's kind of easy to look at a work like that and see how, for example, the art historian John Elderfield could describe these as works that are inspired by place. But of course, you know, Diebenkorn, I think, felt ambivalently about this. I include a quote in my label about uh, his saying, if I wanted to be a landscape painter, I'd be a landscape painter. So, you know, he's clearly interested in, you know, evoking place, but not depicting it directly. Um, I think Berkeley number 24 is just such a striking work in our collection because of the scale of it. So when you're, you stand in front of that piece, you're actually dwarfed by it in a way. So you feel like you yourself are kind of being invited into this space. Uh, but there's one moment, here's the, the giving reality a twist moment. A stripe of orange cuts across the center of the composition that just like takes you out of your reverie in terms of thinking of it as a landscape and reminds you that it's made by a person who's inviting you into his imaginative world. Exactly, and it leads your eye completely into another direction or another, another corner of the composition to spend a moment mm -hmm. in. Okay, well, I'm getting the signal that we're about out of time and we're going to need to wrap up, but thank you all so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to chat with you, Emily, and be in this wonderful sculpture garden at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, Los Angeles. We're here um, for Emily's show, which is Alternate Reality, so we really encourage anyone who has the ability to please come visit the museum and see some of these amazing Diebenkorns and works by other artists that are on view. <laughs> and then also, of course, Diebenkorn 100. So we encourage you to continue using the hashtag and to continue sharing your sightings of Diebenkorn's work. For more information on centennial celebrations and events like this one, please go to diebenkorn.org and look up all the information there. So thank you so much, and I'm going to say farewell. Happy summer. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone.